Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute Fall Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. My name is Paige Shee and I serve as the Strategic Partners Officer for GTMI. Uh, this is our second Lunch and Learn session uh, this semester. GTMI is part of the larger Georgia Tech research enterprise that includes 11 interdisciplinary research institutes. GTMI focuses on manufacturing research, development, and deployment, all designed to address the grand challenges of today's manufacturers. And we assist our partner organizations, both internal and external, uh, with moving innovations from the lab to the marketplace. GTMI has a wide array of facilities and equipment located on main campus for basic research, as well as nearby on 14th Street for more applied research in our advanced manufacturing pilot facility. Our mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, and thought leadership. Each semester, GTMI hosts a Lunch and Learn series. This fall, sessions are being held every Monday as live uh, online events. These sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, undergraduate and graduate level students and researchers, as well as our growing global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. During today's presentation, all audience members are automatically muted to ensure a smooth presentation experience. We encourage you to submit any questions or comments for the speaker using your Q&A panel on your screen as they come to mind throughout the lecture. We'll then address all questions at the end of the lecture. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. David Hart, who will present clean and competitive opportunities for U.S. manufacturing leadership in the global low-carbon economy. David Hart is professor at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University and senior fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, where he directs the Clean Energy Innovation Policy Program. Professor Hart is co-author of Energizing America, a Roadmap to Launch a National Energy Innovation Mission and unlocking energy innovation. His recent work with ITIF includes clean and competitive opportunities for U.S. manufacturing leadership in the global low carbon economy, June 2021 co-authored, building back cleaner with industrial decarbonization demonstration projects, March 2021, and the impact of China's production surge on innovation in the global scholar photovoltaics industry, October 2020. Professor Hart co-chairs the Innovation Policy Forum at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. He served as Senior Associate Dean of the Shar College from 2013 to 2015, and as Assistant Director for Innovation Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy from 2011 to 2012. His other books include The Emergence of Entrepreneurship Policy, Cambridge University Press 2003, and Forbes Consensus Science, Technology, and Economic Policy in the U.S., 1929 to 1953, uh, Princeton University Press, 1998. He received his Ph.D. from MIT in 1995. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hart. Uh, you may give, begin your presentation. Thank you, Paige, and thanks to GTMI for hosting me today. I'm excited to be here. I have a uh, very fond um, Memories and uh, impressions of Georgia Tech. Uh, I was a frequent visitor before the latest uh, tragedy in our global commons, and I look forward to getting back there uh, soon. Um, and let me thank uh, Ben Wang and, and Billy D for um, for inviting me here to to give this talk. Um, I'm going to um, speak about work that I've done under the uh, ITIF label. Um, which is uh, one of my main affiliations. So ITIF, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a think tank uh, that focuses on science and technology policy. It has been ranked as top in that category for a number of years by an index that's um, prepared by the University of Pennsylvania. And I run one of several policy uh, area groups there. So I work on clean energy uh, and climate. Uh, we recently just rebranded ourselves as the Center for Clean Energy uh, Innovation. And like the other units at ITIF, we carry out nonpartisan research and analysis. Uh, in the area of clean energy and climate, we try to cover a, a wide range of topics, although we're a small team. So we're interested in all the emissions creating sectors, any solutions that would reduce or eliminate uh, emissions, and all the policy tools that might, to be, might be brought to bear uh, to, to get those uh, solutions into the field and scaled up to where we need them to get to net zero emissions. So while one of our major focuses is federal R&D spending, um, we also cover many other policy tools, and, and you'll see many of those in today's uh, remarks. 
Uh, we focus primarily on the U.S. federal level, although we do work a bit at the global level and uh, at lower levels of, um, of jurisdictions. And one of our main messages is that this transition to net zero emissions is an opportunity. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to be concerned about, and uh, we should be afraid of the damage that changing climate is doing to our ecosystems, to our society. Uh, but if we focus on the fear, we may be paralyzed. And what we need to do is concentrate on opportunities, uh, opportunities for a better life in a different kind of economy. So that's what I want to uh, talk about today. Um, I'm going to present a report. It's uh, got many co-authors, and um, it was a joint production with uh, two other institutions. This report came out in June of 2021, and uh, the full text is available online. And as I'll mention, many of the backup materials are also available, including videos from our, our workshops. Uh, the partners in this effort, along with ITIF, were the Boston University Institute for Sustainable Energy, which is led by Peter Fox Penner. And um, our overall effort was really spearheaded by Henry Kelly, who is a senior fellow at BU ISE. Uh, Henry was a senior official in uh, the Clinton and Obama administrations. Uh, and is a real storehouse of technical uh, expertise. We also work with the Fraunhofer Center for Manufacturing Innovation, which is based at BU, um, although it's part of the wider global Fraunhofer network, which is uh, based in Germany. So this report presents uh, what we call phase one of the effort. Uh, we did it kind of on a shoestring budget, but we've now got more funding to do uh, more rigorous and detailed uh, phase two. So I would really welcome your comments and questions. Certainly nothing that we've uh, written here is uh, beyond debate uh, other than perhaps uh, the, the climate uh, crisis itself. Um, but we're moving into new territory. There's a need for a lot of voices and uh, a vigorous debate around uh, both what the uh, technological opportunities are and what the appropriate policies are. So this is really what the report is about. Uh, we have two big challenges uh, that we focus on. Um, the first is dealing with uh, climate change and averting any further damage to the extent that we can. But we also in the United States want to rebuild our, our economy. We want to create a vibrant and inclusive economy, and that means that manufacturing has to be strong. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here at, at GTMI, uh, but I don't think enough people have put thought into bringing these two streams of, of discussion and policymaking together. And if we're going to move between now and 2050, as we hope, to a net zero emissions economy, we need to have a strategy that integrates, you know, climate policy with manufacturing policy. So we want to figure out which industries present the best opportunities for the United States uh, to gain um, an advantage globally so that it can um, have manufacturing jobs and hopefully uh, export new technologies that it's going to create. Uh, While well, it also reduces uh, emissions and obviously as an exporter creates opportunities for other countries to reduce their emissions as well. So that's, um, that's the main theme of, of the work and, um, uh, and everything I say will just elaborate on this kind of core point. Uh, manufacturing matters for lots of reasons. It needs to be part of that vibrant, inclusive economy uh, for many reasons. Um, again, I don't think I need to recount those in detail for, for this audience. Uh, we saw during the pandemic, that uh, manufacturing is critical for societal resilience. Uh, it has been a pathway for uh, lesser educated individuals to join the middle class, helping alleviate our, our equity problem in the United States. Uh, manufacturing firms are responsible for most of the R&D spending in the private sector, most of the patents, so it's critical for innovation um, and, uh, and our competitiveness uh, globally. Uh, it's important for our national security. And then on the slide here, I've just uh, pictured my, my favorite rationale, which has to do with trade. Uh, we need to have a better balance in our, in our trade to have a stable economy. And as you can see, uh, our manufacturing trade balance has, has uh, diminished, um, deteriorated uh, over the course of this century. And at the moment, it doesn't really show signs of improving. So, um, so these are all reasons to care about uh, manufacturing. We should also care about manufacturing in the climate context. So industry, as these emissions are measured, is responsible, excuse me, sorry, responsible for about 30% of U.S. greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, that's including both direct emissions, which are pictured here, that is 
emissions at the site of industrial activity, as well as indirect emissions, which are from electricity that's used for industrial processes. So, um, so you know, if a, if a power plant is burning coal, sending the electricity to a manufacturing plant, that would count as an indirect uh, emission. So we need to worry about manufacturing because industry causes emissions. It's also important because other sectors like transportation, like electric uh, power, are going to use manufactured goods. And we may also need uh, to pull carbon out of the air. That's called negative emissions or, um, or uh, for some forms of a direct air capture. Again, that's going to use a lot of manufactured uh, uh, goods to, to, to be implemented. Um, and as I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, manufacturing may also be able to uh, displace emissions from other emission sectors. And I'll talk specifically about uh, agriculture, uh, where manufactured goods might replace um, uh, cultivated goods. So um, there's a huge uh, retooling going on. Um, and as we move towards a major climate summit in about a month, uh, nations have been announcing net zero targets. So net zero doesn't mean absolute zero for every emission sector. We may have uh, the ability to take emissions out of the air through natural means, such as forests, uh, as well as these direct air capture technologies that I mentioned. Um, but uh, quite a few nations have announced at least targets for 2050, or in the case of China, 2060. And that means that they're going to have to attack the manufacturing sector, which has been to a great extent left because it's really hard to deal with the uh, emissions from that sector. But it's very much on the agenda now. And um, you know, that creates a tremendous opportunity if we, you know, as a globe, all move in this direction um, at the same time. And if you look back at industrial history, as I have, uh, we can see that this kind of change in the uh, core industrial processes of particular sectors can radically alter the international competitive positions of nations. So we saw it um, with the second industrial revolution when, uh, when Germany um, you know, displaced England to a great extent from that position. Uh, we've seen it with Japan and the United States uh, in the mid part and late part of the 20th uh, century. Um, and I think China has this vision uh, now that this opportunity it could create an opportunity. This change in, in our industrial structure could create an opportunity for it to alter its position. And we see China taking a very uh, aggressive stance, for instance, uh, in electric vehicles. Um, and other countries as well. The European Union has gotten uh, going on this. And, and I think the rest of the industrial world um, is aware of it. And the United States just hasn't been aware as it needs to be. So this is what we are hoping for, an integrated clean manufacturing strategy. Um, the United States particular advantage in, uh, in the global economy as a whole, but especially in manufacturing is its strength in science and technology. Um, so we wanna leverage that strength. And um, you know, it doesn't always necessarily mean that we'll have a co absolute competitive advantage, even in areas where we're strong in science and technology. We have to go further in our analysis and think about uh, scaling up and um, and you know the, the way um, uh, industrial products are made, uh, so it's a targeted uh, strategy. Um, but once we figure out you know where we want to go, we need to act with all of the tools toolkit. Um, so R and D spending uh, demonstration, which has been a particular focus of mine, uh, early deployment, things like using government procurement to provide an incentive to companies to to change their uh, processes and, and so on. So this quote on the slide here is from uh, from the report. Until recently, these two national challenges have been treated largely within their own uh, policy silos. Um, as we thought through this uh, question, uh, this problem, we um, relied on work by my colleague at ITIF, Rob Atkinson, who's the president. Uh, Rob has advanced a broader agenda, not just uh, focused on uh, on emissions, but on uh, the overall industrial sector, and um, a set of questions that should guide industrial policy. So we uh, tried to use these to identify sectors where the U.S. might have a competitive, competitive advantage. Um, so those four questions are here. Can the industry contribute to national goals? Um, in this case, we're thinking about net zero emissions, so obviously that's an important national goal. Can it leverage existing strengths? Would federal policy strengthen industry performance? 
And importantly, is industry willing and would it share the costs? And I think that's an open question um, in a number of sectors. And then for our purposes in this project, we wanted to identify overlooked sectors. So there are some sectors that have gotten a lot of attention um, and others that really haven't been looked at carefully, although that is changing. Uh, so one of the areas that we're going to talk about is hydrogen. Uh, when we started this project a year ago, hydrogen was not uh, front and center, but now, now it really is. So, um, so what we did was identify uh, four areas, and I'm going to go into a bit of depth on each one. Um, the way we did our research, as I mentioned, kind of on a shoestring, primarily by interviewing experts and uh, hosting a series of workshops. So these workshops can be viewed. Uh, we had a fantastic um, set of speakers, and the videos are all available um, through the BU or the ITIF uh, websites, and I would encourage anybody who's interested in any of these uh, four areas to uh, to go take a look. Um, and um, But I should be very clear that we didn't try to seek a consensus at these workshops. We uh, tried to draw you know, conclusions from what we learned and obviously leverage our own expertise to identify um, where the opportunities for the United States might be. And we came up with these four, hydrogen production, heating, cooling, and drying equipment, chemical production and recycling, and biotech-based alternatives to meat and dairy products. And in the second phase of the report, we're gonna really drill down deeply into the chemical sector. So that work is just beginning. And I'll, I think I'll come back to that briefly uh, at the end. I also wanna acknowledge our funding, uh, our funders. We got support for this effort from Breakthrough Energy and uh, the Spitzer Trust, which is a core supporter of, of ITIF. So let me um, go into the four areas and I'm gonna start with uh, hydrogen. Um, so we do make hydrogen in the United States uh, already, about uh, 10 million um, metric tons per year. And the production process is itself a large emitter. So we need to clean up hydrogen uh, production, even if we didn't use it for any other uh, purposes. Um, so right now, uh, the global hydrogen production produces the same amount of emissions as you know, the United Kingdom and Indonesia combined. So it's a major source of, um, of emissions. Um, but there's a potential to use hydrogen if we can produce it in a clean way to a much greater extent in this, uh, in this uh, net zero economy that we're uh, visualizing. So here are a couple of estimates, one from the Princeton Net Zero America project. They forecast in their scenario um, that we, the United States might use as much as 60, uh, um, produce as much as 60 million metric tons of hydrogen in 2050. And in an NREL study, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory estimated the technical potential for hydrogen production to be over 100 uh, a million metric tons, so 10 times uh, the current uh, production. Um, so I mentioned there are uh, several different ways to make uh, hydrogen. Uh, the current way is called steam. The most dominant current way is called steam methane reforming. Um, it's about $2 uh, per kilogram, the production cost there. Uh, and that's without capturing uh, any of the carbon. So that's the that's the emissions that we could clean up um, just in hydrogen production itself. And then you see here, this is work from Resources for the Future, a couple of other uh, cost estimates, um, putting carbon capture equipment, so just capturing the, 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 the um, exhaust stream from um, the existing hydrogen production process, raises the cost just uh, slightly. Uh, this has come to be known as blue hydrogen, um, but a lot of people are excited about green hydrogen. So uh, hydrogen right now is taken from uh, natural gas. So we take natural gas out of the, out of the ground, uh, heat it up, um, uh, pressurize it, um, and extract the hydrogen. Um, but electrolysis, or so-called green hydrogen, would use water as the input, uh, apply electricity, and split it into its constituent parts, one of which, of course, is hydrogen. Um, and if you did that with low carbon electricity, then you would eliminate the emission altogether and you wouldn't have to worry about um, carbon, carbon capture. Uh, so in 2020, you can see the price of green hydrogen is a lot more than blue hydrogen. Um, in 2030, it's estimated that the, they will become closer. Uh, there's another process that's used with um, natural gas called autothermal reforming. Uh, it's not used today because it's more expensive overall, but if you want to capture carbon, there are some advantages. It produces a more concentrated stream of carbon dioxide, so it's a better fit with uh, CCS. And in 2030, um, 
the estimates at the time that we did our study, and this is changing by the day, um, suggested that it would still be advantageous to produce so-called blue hydrogen relative to green hydrogen. Although, of course, you only capture 90% of the carbon in this uh, estimate. Um, but by 2050, because of economies of scale and electrolyzer production and other advantages, um, green hydrogen uh, will eventually become cheaper. Uh, the U.S. is um, not really geared up at the moment for hydrogen production. Um, so this chart shows, uh, the line shows current production uh, <clears throat> of clean hydrogen. It's pretty small. But the stack, you can see these are all announced projects, and they're mostly uh, in other places. Um, the European Union has announced a very ambitious plan to have 40 gigawatts of green hydrogen electrolyzers running by 2030. Uh, Australia, uh, taking advantage of its tremendous solar resources, is envisioning um, building a green ammonia plant. So ammonia is a carrier of hydrogen or can be a carrier of hydrogen. Um, so the U.S. at the moment is not uh, well positioned uh, to compete, um, but um, but there are opportunities. Uh, the U.S. Uh, obviously it has a tremendous natural gas industry. Um, it does have some demonstration facilities that make hydrogen with carbon capture and storage, so so-called uh, blue hydrogen. And there may be um, more opportunities to pursue that, especially if the tax uh, incentives that are currently under consideration are are pushed through uh, the Congress. But to get to a really competitive position in green hydrogen, the U.S. should be doing a lot more. And in fact, the, the current administration, the Biden administration, has announced now this uh, goal, which was talked about when we were writing the report, of a dollar per kilogram uh, of green hydrogen production by, by 2030. That's a very ambitious goal, as you saw from the previous cost estimates. Um, there are a lot of other things that the U.S. should be doing. Uh, much, much of our hydrogen uh, R&D funding is in the vehicle technology office at DOE rather than an industrial office. Um, it's been focused a lot on light duty transportation where it seems pretty clear that batteries are going to win out over fuel cells which use hydrogen. So we need to diversify our R&D efforts. We need to be building demonstration plants. Uh, we need to be using uh, federal purchasing power, whether it's the defense sector or the civilian sector to um, give an incentive to manufacturers to produce clean hydrogen. Um, and we also have to deal with the uh, safety issues that surround hydrogen. It is uh, inflammable, as anybody who uh, knows about the Hindenburg uh, realizes, and it is corrosive. Um, so uh, it's not an easy material to handle. And um, you know it's important for public, con public to be confident if we're gonna use this uh, material in much larger quantities uh, that it's uh, being done safely. Um, so these are the opportunities in the area of hydrogen. Second one, heating, cooling, and drying. <clears throat> um, uh, many buildings use uh, natural gas, and, and some even use oil uh, for heating. Um, a lot of low temperature industrial processes um, also use those uh, fuels and could potentially use alternative technologies, especially uh, heat pumps. So uh, the uh, International Energy Agency uh, notes that cooling is the fasting, fastest growing use of energy in buildings. Uh, and you can see their um, estimates here. Uh, this is global estimate from the International Energy Agency of, um, of heat pumps in their net zero by 2050 scenario, you know, would grow by, uh, by an order of magnitude, roughly speaking. Um, so there is a potential for enormous growth in demand, and a question should be asked: Who's going to provide? Uh, who's going to provide um, those those heat pumps and, and other uh, heating, cooling, and drying equipment? Um, there are also great opportunities to improve uh, heat pumps. So they're currently roughly a third of their theoretical efficiency, and of course we're not going to hit the exact theoretical efficiency. But there are a lot of different pathways, and I wouldn't represent myself as a technical expert. But we heard from numerous experts in our workshops uh, about a whole different, a whole wide array of, of paths, um, novel refrigerants, um, new kinds of membranes and mechanical drying systems, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is where U.S. innovation, U.S. science and technological strength uh, can be leveraged, but we are starting from a position uh, of relative disadvantage, uh, I would say, in this area. So uh, as I mentioned, we work closely with the Fraunhofer Institute, and we were really impressed with the German and European experts that we uh, met in this area. 
Um, so here's a short summary of, of that. Um, right now, the United States doesn't buy very many uh, heat pumps. So U.S. manufacturers don't have a very strong incentive to perform the kind of R&D, especially, uh, um, you know, revolutionary or, or ambitious R&D that we're calling for. Uh, as in hydrogen, the European Union has a roadmap. They want to build 36 heat pump mega factories by 2030. And of course, Japan uh, and, and Korea, for that matter, are both um, really, uh, really good at, at, at producing these kinds of uh, appliances. Um, even so, we think that there's a chance for the United States, uh, if it if it takes, um, you know, assertive action, to to play a bigger role in this industry than it does now. So I think we'll, you'll see this in all the sectors. There's a need for an integrated R D and D uh, roadmap. Um, our manufacturers may need some help uh, funding their plants. Uh, so the Department of Energy has a loan programs office, which assists um, those kinds of uh, uh, efforts, uh, could assist those kinds of efforts that has done so in, in transportation, for instance. Um, we need standards for heat pumps um, that go into building codes uh, that are based on an integrated analysis, uh, integrated systems analysis. And as with, again, as with hydrogen, um, the federal government, you know, owns and operates a lot of buildings. And um, there's a chance to use the federal purse to, to drive innovation in the heating and cooling uh, and drying area. Uh, the third area is uh, chemicals. Um, so this is a big uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions. Around 18% of U.S. emissions from the industrial sector come just from chemicals. It's also a big employer. Around 10% of the U.S. manufacturing workforce uh, is in the chemicals uh, industry. Um, and it's facing uh, some challenges, you know, beyond just its own emissions. Um, it's uh, closely integrated with the oil and gas uh, industry. And that industry, if, if the electric vehicle revolution, you know, takes off and the renewables revolution continues, uh, the market for oil and gas is going to be diminished uh, considerably. Um, so those companies are placing more and more stock in the idea of, of plastics and other chemicals to, um, to keep them going through this transition. Uh, but it's a complicated situation for them because these, um, you know, these markets are all are all interconnected. And as I said, we're going to drill down more deeply into this in the coming uh, years' research. Uh, Fatih Birol, the executive director of the IEA, called petrochemicals quote one of the key blind spots in the global energy debate. So it really hasn't been uh, studied and analyzed nearly to the extent that it, it should be. Um, so chemicals. Uh, you know, use fossil fuels um, as a feedstock uh, for petrochemicals, and also they use a lot of energy in the in the production process. Um, a couple of opportunities that we focus on uh, include uh, recycling, improving recycling of chemicals, um, including new systems that would take apart chemicals to their constituent, you know, elements or or molecules, sort them, and then you could use those uh, to remanufacture um, uh, chemicals. And then um, we got particularly set excited about the bioproduction opportunities uh, using biofeedstocks, using fermentation techniques, uh, including, as we heard from Dan Nocera at Harvard, uh, artificial photosynthesis. So he's got some amazing ideas to use uh, artificial, you know, more efficient uh, uh, photosynthesis to, um, to make chemicals. Um, and right now there there aren't uh, there isn't a lot of recycling um, in the U.S. Only about 10% of uh, plastics in the U.S. are made from recycled materials, and that compares with 70% of steel. So the U.S. recycles a lot of steel. Uh, there are some other opportunities as well that we they didn't go into deeply. Um, you can use these materials more efficiently. You can replace them in some cases with with uh, other materials. Um, but these were the the, the two. Um, uh, areas of opportunity that we went into in a little bit more uh, depth. How is the U.S. positioned? Well, not as well as it used to be. So the um, the, the boxes here uh, compare um, uh, R&D spending around the world um, in the most recent measures, which was in the late 2010s with uh, 10 years before that. And especially China has really improved its um, investment in chemicals. So whereas, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, the U.S. spent twice or three times as much as China on uh, chemical R&D and uh, less than the European Union. Now the U.S. and the EU are roughly equivalent, but China is spending uh, more. So um, 
So again, you know, uh, I think the U.S. is in a in a position of strength still in chemical, certainly compared to the um, to the other two sectors that I mentioned. Uh, but I don't think the industry necessarily has its uh, eye on the ball um, and isn't thinking about the kind of transformation that uh, will be required to eliminate uh, emissions. So some policies uh, for this industry. Um, again, a roadmap uh, with support and um, you know pursuing a broad portfolio. Uh, we think this is particularly important, this idea of a broad portfolio uh, in chemicals um, compared to other sectors because there's so much less known about the uh, pathways. Um, so until we really you know, advance those technologies and compare them and look at their costs, uh, we're not really sure which way to go. So this is an area where a broad portfolio will pay off uh, particularly well. Um, it's an area that in includes multiple agencies. Um, the USDA and the bio area really has not been much of a player. And uh, that's uh, an agency that we would like to see get uh, more involved. Um, the Department of Energy, again, caught a little bit because this is sort of seen as USDA territory, um, not directly an energy topic per se. Uh, again, a little bit uh, reluctant to, um, to get so involved in this uh, industry. Um, National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, so all of these uh, agencies have roles to play. Uh, there is a USDA program called BioPreferred, which um, as, as it uh, as the term suggests, um, creates uh, opportunities for bioproducts to get an advantage in, in procurement. Um, so that could be uh, used. Um, labeling of chemicals, I think this is an area overall, so-called carbon transparency that's growing across many sectors. Um, and I think it could be used to good effect in the chemical uh, industry. Um, and there are some opportunities to bring um, new kinds of uh, development to rural areas. Uh, so a lot of chemical plants are cited in rural areas. These areas may be disadvantaged by the transition in um, to the net zero economy. And uh, so that's an aspect of this industry that um, federal policy should take uh, into account. The last industry is the one that I did the most work on. So this is the one that I can speak to um, the most otherwise. We'll also confess that I really knew nothing about it before I started this project and I got really excited and interested in it and I would like to do uh, more work on it. And as I said um, at the outset, this is one where um, manufacturing might be able to displace emissions from another sector, in this case, uh, agriculture. So uh, agriculture is, especially on a global basis, a large greenhouse gas source, source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's also a sink, so the soil absorbs carbon. Um, but just looking at the emission side, 12% uh, or even up to 15% of some estimates um, uh, of global greenhouse gases come from uh, agriculture. And they particularly come from livestock and, um, and manure. So that's roughly half of that uh, agricultural total. Um, and when we throw in um, land use changes and inputs that go into agriculture, you know, it's a big, it's a big slice of, of the emissions pie. Uh, it's also a big employer. So in the United States, just the meat, poultry, and dairy industries alone employ more than half a million uh, people. And that's the focus of this, um, this uh, sector that I'm going to talk about, uh, replacing meat and dairy products with um, products that are similar or in some cases perhaps even the same, uh, but made in a manufacturing setting. So through, through fermentation or cell culture uh, techniques. Um, so this. Um, this opportunity emerges because of breakthroughs in biological research, especially um, synthetic uh, biology. Uh, so that's all been enabled by the dropping cost of gene sequencing and, and gene synthesis. Um, bioengineers can produce pretty much anything they want, as I understand it now, uh, at the bench level. So if you know, you know the genetic code for a, a chemical, um, you know, they can figure out a biological system that can produce it in, in small quantities. Um, another uh, thread of this industry is um, tissue culture, so to create um, meat substitutes or even actual meat cells, um, so in, in bioreactors. Uh, this is not as far along as the uh, fermentation pathway, but it is drawing a lot of interest from venture capital these days. Um, but while these uh, bioengineers can make these uh, products on a small scale, uh, they can't do it uh, on a large scale for the kinds of prices that you and I might want to pay in that supermarket. Um, 
but there is some, um, you know, some excitement about the cost reductions that uh, can be envisioned. And uh, obviously, many of us have seen Impossible Foods and, and um, uh, Beyond Meat. These are generally not um, in the same class as this. So these are plant-based proteins not uh, produced necessarily by biotechnology, although um, Impossible Foods, Foods does use a biotech uh, ingredient. Um, but, um, but, you know, given where the technologies are now, uh, some people envision that they could be competitive with, um, with uh, co conventional food products within, uh, within 10 years. And they also would cut emissions really substantially. Um, so some recent studies have shown that the reductions may be as much as 90%, especially for beef. So beef is the most carbon intensive of our uh, food products. Um, less intensive, less greenhouse gas intensive meats like pork and chicken, you know, don't have quite as dramatic a reduction, but nonetheless, it is uh, uh, substantial. So there's a chance here uh, to, um, to uh, you know, replace a very core technology in, in our economy with something um, uh, quite different. Um, and this is an area, again, where I think the U.S. is uh, well positioned. Um, now, I would say that the emissions reductions from biotech, meat, and dairy are further off than the other sectors I talked about. It could be a second half of the 21st century story rather than a first half of the 21st century. Uh, but it is really important because as people become wealthy, they eat more and more uh, protein. And we would like the rest of the world to become as wealthy as we are, at least I would. And so uh, we want to make sure that as they, um, as they change their lifestyle, you know, that they aren't adding to uh, carbon emissions. So uh, the U.S. is a leader in uh, synthetic biology. Uh, we have a very active venture capital and startup uh, culture. Um, the U.S. consumer uh, may be accepting of biotech foods. I wouldn't say that's a sure thing, uh, probably because not many have had exposure. And so it's kind of hard to compare. So it'll depend a lot, I think, on how these products are rolled out. Um, but as in the other sectors, the rest of the world is not uh, standing still. Um, so uh, Singapore and Israel are probably the best known uh, homes of these kinds of uh, companies. Um, and in Europe, uh, they have a very strong uh, fermentation industry for, um, in, the, in the more conventional sense. And one of the big gaps that we found in the United States was um, intermediate range uh, test bed facilities. So we have lots of lab facilities, and then we have sort of giant facilities, but not a whole lot in between where a company might want to scale up, you know, it might have to go. And we have seen instances of companies uh, leave the United States for Europe um, and even for Mexico to get access to those intermediate scale facilities. So, um, so what should we be done? Well, this just needs to become a focus of federal research. It just hasn't been. Um, we need research and development across the whole uh, production chain, so from the base of feedstocks through the systems um, and into the scale-up. Uh, we have a potential vehicle for that, something called the Agricultural Advanced R&D Authority, or something like an Agricultural uh, DARPA or ARPA. This was authorized by the Congress, but it hasn't been uh, funded yet. Uh, I mentioned the need to invest in test beds and scale-up facilities. Uh, there is an interesting um, new Manufacturing USA um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Institute uh, called Biomade, which um, could potentially go into this area, although it's not necessarily uh, focused on food, but that's supported by the Department of Defense, and it may provide a model for scaling up and, and cooperative uh, research. Um, like some of the other sectors, it's important to have effective regulation um, so that provides co confidence to consumers. Um, we also need to think about equity and fairness here as well, and, and um, think about how, you know, our producers may transition over what, whatever period uh, this industry grows um, so that uh, we're not leaving, uh, leaving those people behind. So that's the core of the presentation. Um, let me just reiterate uh, the bottom line here. Uh, the United States needs an integrated strategy, and I don't mean to say that what we've suggested is an integrated strategy. What we've uh, identified are some of the building blocks of a potential integrated strategy. Um, the integration is between manufacturing on the one hand and climate on the other hand. Uh, so we're starting to think about that, you know, much more um, rigorously. Uh, as we have done in electric power and are beginning to now do and implement in transportation. So we need that kind of a strategy for, uh, for manufacturing. Um, 
we have a nice little infographic if you go to the website and you don't want to read uh, all the details of the report, you know, you're welcome to download this and, and share it. Uh, so it summarizes our, our main uh, arguments and, and recommendations. Um, and as I said, you can uh, view the uh, presentations um, in the workshop um, online. Um, you can visit all of our institutional sites and uh, uh, learn about other work that we're doing. For instance, I mentioned uh, industrial demonstration projects. That's an area that I've been very active in and that has you know, a strong overlap with the clean and competitive uh, report. Um, and then we're moving ahead uh, with a new phase. Um, so we're gonna study the petrochemical industry. Uh, specifically, we're gonna look at polyvinyl chloride. So the full value chain in that, um, in that industry. If there's anybody who's watching who works on that topic, we would love to be in touch with you. Uh, as I mentioned, we think this is a sector that's been um, neglected and uh, really needs uh, attention. Um, we've picked this sub uh, sector for a number of reasons, um, largely because uh, it's simpler to analyze than some of the others, but we hope that we're going to create a methodology that could be used in other uh, chemical industry subsectors. Uh, we're currently just just getting started uh, developing a, a baseline. You know, what is the current industry in the U.S.? What does it make? Where is it located? Uh, who does it employ? And so on. Then we'll engage in a similar but much more uh, focused process of workshops and expert interviews to uh, think through what are the pathways to decarbonizing the sector? What's the role of bio? What's the role of carbon capture? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we hope to come out of that with a vision of the 2050 uh, industry. What does a decarbonized uh, petrochemical PVC value chain really look like? You know, where would it be located and um, who would it employ and so on? I'm not sure we'll get to a you know, granular um, uh, vision because of the great uncertainty, but at least we can start to set out where the goalposts are so we can make progress. And as I said, it's mostly funded. Uh, we're still looking for a little bit more to fill in some gaps, uh, but we're really excited about this project uh, it's the same um, group of, uh, uh, of leaders, and we've also uh, hired uh, and brought on a colleague who's one of the leading experts um, in the chemical industry to, to, to help us uh, understand it. Um, and we're interested in connecting with you know, others around the country and around the world who are working on this topic. Um, other work, you know, if you want to delve into our program, uh, we have a new report out today on carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Um, I mentioned the work on demonstration policy. Uh, I've done work on solar PV uh, manufacturing, uh, particularly looking at the impact of Chinese subsidies on that uh, industry. Um, ITIF as a whole did a broader uh, project of looking at a number of industries beyond, um, beyond the energy sector under the label innovation mercantilism. Uh, we're working on iron and steel decarbonization, and uh, we'll have a lot more to come in the future. So uh, I do welcome your questions. Um, and uh, let me thank again uh, GTMI for inviting me here. And uh, with that, I will um, open it up. Thank you, Dr. Hart. It's been a pleasure to uh, have you join us today and present today's Lunch and Learn session. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to go ahead and submit any questions you have for Dr. Hart using the Q&A panel um, on your screen. I see one question so far. I just wanted to comment first on a few things that you mentioned, Dr. Hart. Um, you know, first of all, thank you for presenting this. I think it's really informative and timely overview of clean and competitive opportunities for U.S. manufacturing. I know you, you highlighted the four opportunity areas of hydrogen production, uh, heating, cooling, and drying, chemical production and recycling, and the biotech-based meat and dairy products. Um, with respect to the chemical production and recycling, I was curious, you... Um, you mentioned that uh, only about 10% of plastics are recycled compared to 70% of steel. Um, and you laid out a number of policy initiatives that could potentially improve things in general in that area. But in your opinion, is there, um, is there anything that can be done most immediately or near term to improve plastics recycling? Or what, what, are, what do you see as the major barriers in that area? Yeah, so um, I guess I should first confess my, you know, I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert uh, on this topic. I mean, I think, I mean, I think at the core uh, of it right now, I think you have two, you have two challenges. Uh, one is, um, you know, it's, 
it is not as effective in, in many cases as just using virgin materials. I mean, the, the um, you know, the feedstocks are really cheap. And, um, and then the second is, uh, you know, societal uh, institutions and, and habits. So we haven't really inculcated a, a plastics recycling culture. Um, in some cases, it's hard to do because the products are, you know, all messed up with what's ever inside them. Um, uh, so, you know, I think it, it's, it will take a concerted effort both to change the culture, but also we need to improve the technology for a recycling um, because it's, you know, it, it can be just as cheap to, to make new materials. Um, but, uh, you know, I would, I would say the, you know, the biggest factor is sort of the throwaway culture. And it's just, you know, not something that people see as a, uh, as a priority. Uh, in the case of steel, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a, there's an economic incentive to <laughs> recycle steel because you can, at least for many products, um, you know, make it cheaper. So the, 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 the United States, um, industry has really shifted to uh, recycling as the input. And a lot of the virgin steel is in the rest of the world at this point. That makes sense, thank you. Um, just two other comments and, I'll, and then I'll go to the audience Q&A. Uh, you mentioned the Fraunhofer Institute was a collaborator on this report. Uh, interestingly, we hope to have a speaker from, from that institute uh, in our spring lunch and learn series next, next year you also or uh, mentioned the um, NREL. So we actually have an NREL uh, presentation on October 4th. It's part of our Lunch and Learn um, session. We have two speakers um, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So there's a bit of a theme here uh, this, this semester and, and into next year. And then just one other comment I'd like to make is that you mentioned uh, Biomade might offer some potential um, and uh, that's one of the newest or the newest MIIs Manufacturing USA Innovation Institutes. And Georgia Tech is actually one of the key institutes that that is part of Biomade. So we have a connection there as well. But I do see a question from an audience member here, um, Billy D. What is the major limitation hindering cost reduction in green hydrogen production by solar electrolysis? Is it related to costs of electrocatalyst materials for hydrogen evolution reaction? Well, I actually, let me just uh, comment on, on yours page and then I'll come to Billy's sure. question. So, um, so this gives me a chance to plug uh, Manufacturing USA. So I was fortunate enough to spend a year uh, at the White House, as you mentioned, and um, had a chance to be involved in the, um, the beginning of Manufacturing USA. And Ben Wong was, was there as well, and, and, and many from Georgia Tech. Uh, Bud Peterson, the former president, was one of the leaders of that effort. And to the extent that we have, you know, something comparable in the United States to the Fraunhofer Institute, it is that. It is that program. Um, so Fraunhofer is a, an enormous system, um, and it's meant to bridge the gap between industry and academia. And of course, our universities do that. You know, Georgia Tech are preeminent among them. Um, but uh, we need a more extensive effort to link industrial and basic research together. Um, so you know, in some of the areas that I mentioned, you know, we call for those kinds of institutes. Um, I know that Georgia Tech is really active in manufacturing in the USA, and that's and that's great. Um, the Biomade Institute is really the leading edge of an effort to improve biomanufacturing. Um, but as I said, you know, we don't know for sure that they'll go into the food industry. They're funded by the Department of Defense. So, you know, their imperative is not carbon reduction, um, although I know the leadership is interested in that and DOD is interested in that. But, um, but other priorities may, um, you know, may, may, may dominate there. But, you know, I, I think um, it's encouraging that the United States has started to develop these institutions, and um, it's going to need them a lot more as it goes through this uh, transition to net zero. Uh, okay, so what about green hydrogen? I mean, green hydrogen is almost entirely controlled by the cost of energy. But that's the biggest factor. I'm sure there are ways to improve um, uh, uh, improve um, the, the catalysts and the electrolysis process itself, but my understanding is that it's really uh, it's really the energy costs that are going to be the biggest driver. And, and uh, where we see green hydrogen sort of starting to be um, developed is in places like Australia, uh, where they have you know a tremendous solar resource. Um, uh, <clears throat> maybe in um, in Scandinavia where they're using hydro. So. Um, so I think that that's the biggest factor, but I also I'm confident that there are many ways that the manufacturing, the, the production process itself, can can be improved. 
Thank you. And we have another question that's come in. Um, thank you for a great lecture, Professor Hart. On trade deficit, what can be done on the policy front to reverse the trend? Yeah, well, that is, uh, you know, the trillion dollar question, you might say. Um, it's a complicated one because the trade deficit is only partly related to what you might think of as industry fundamentals, where we compare, you know, a plant in one country with a plant in another country. Uh, there are a lot of other factors, such as monetary policy, interest rates, um, and, and so on. Uh, so, um, so there's no simple answer to this, but but I really think, you know, putting effort into industrial policy. So, uh, as we kind of laid out in our strategy, you know, thinking where can we, you know, lead, where can we really make a difference, and then putting some public effort behind those uh, sectors. This is a little bit heretical. So the conventional wisdom in economics has been, you know, just just support, you know, the, the economy as a whole and don't don't pick uh, sectors. Um, but the rest of the world is is picking sectors, and China, you know, is especially picking lots of sectors. Um, but other countries as well. Um, and again, this has been a core research focus for ITIF. So you can find many reports on the ITIF website uh, about this. Um, and so, I mean, I guess I would say the bottom line is we need to, you know, do more at home. We shouldn't be necessarily attacking other countries or putting tariffs in place, although that may be necessary in some sectors. But, you know, we're, what we need to do is build um, American strength. And that includes, you know, our workforce, educating the workforce uh, more effectively. Um, that means helping our small and medium manufacturers that are the supply chain uh, that have a hard time adopting new technologies. Um, as well as, you know, this kind of collaborative R&D where big companies and small companies uh, come together. So, uh, so there's a lot of threads to that, um, but I would, I would place the emphasis on doing more at home, at least first, before we uh, get into, um, you know, putting up uh, uh, barriers against uh, imports. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions at this time, but we still have a few minutes remaining in our in our hour here. So I'd encourage um, the audience members who are with us to to submit any additional questions you have through the Q and A panel. Um, and I'll use this time also just to mention some of our upcoming lunch and learn events. So our lunch and learn series is held every Monday through uh, November fifteenth for the fall series. Uh, as I mentioned, this is our today was our second lecture of, of the fall semester. And next Monday, September 27th, we will feature uh, Dr. Bruno, Bruno Marx from Century Therapeutics. He will present on the topic of bioprocessing hypoimmune IPSC toward cost-effective and high-quality allogeneic cell therapies. And uh, if some of our audience members are interested more in the clean energy topic, as I mentioned, we have another lecture coming up on October 4th uh, by Dr. Jill Engel Cox and Samantha Reese from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory on the topic of supply chain for energy technologies. Yeah, let me also plug uh, something I'm working on that it brings to mind. So I, I, I certainly I don't know the next speaker, but I recommend uh, Jill Engel Cox and her colleagues from from NWL. And uh, I'm also uh, actually was connected to this series by Chip White uh, from Georgia Tech, and we're together on the board of the Industry Studies Association. And we are running a series of webinars as well on the supply chain uh, assessment. So the, uh, the White House um, ordered the federal government to carry out four uh, supply chain studies. I'm sure Jill Engel Cox will speak to, to one of them. Um, and so we're going to do a session on the pharmaceutical supply chain, <coughs> um, uh, uh, electric bat uh, batteries for electric cars, uh, and semiconductors. So that. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, that's at the Industry Studies Association. Thank you for that. Yes, um, GTMI and Georgia Tech are doing a lot of work in, in the supply chain area, especially in, in pharmaceuticals. So um, I think that'll pique the interest of a lot of people. And as a reminder, if uh, our audience members are interested in referencing some of the material you presented today, I believe they can go to the itif.org website. Is that correct? Yeah, you can, you can find the full report there um, and the webinars that we, uh, um, workshops that we conducted and, um, you know, lots of other stuff. Yeah, please do. Wonderful. And it uh, looks like we have another question that's come in uh, from Oksana. Are there natural ways to mitigate agriculture emissions, such as treating manure, instead of manufacturing meat substitutes? 
Yes, of course. I don't. I don't mean to represent this as the only solution for agricultural emissions. Um, changing uh, tilling practices is one um, that's pretty well known. Um, so a lot of, uh, and I should also say there's a lot that's not really known about soil carbon sequestration. There's a lot of interest in paying farmers to sequester carbon in the soil, but I don't think we want to do that until we know that the carbon is going to stay there and not be released again. Um, there's a lot of uh, energy used in, in uh, farming, especially in the developed world. So um, farmers like other producers can shift to low carbon energy, um, electric vehicles, for instance. I know actually when I was down in Georgia Tech, uh, no, it was in North Carolina State, um, we saw a prototype um, combine that John Deere was um, making uh, electric an electric combine. Um, so uh, pesticide use, um, and fertilizer use are also major sources of emissions. So if they can use those products, uh, you know, more effectively, um, that would be an important way to reduce emissions. Um, some of the emissions are really hard to, to deal with um, though. So rice cultivation seems to emit uh, methane, you know, intrinsically, um, cattle emit methane. Uh, there is some interest in changing um, cattle feed so you can potentially add something to the cattle feed that would reduce the methane production. So, um, yeah, so I think it's really important not to focus in, in all of these sectors on a single silver bullet. Um, and I don't believe that, you know, 100 years from now, nobody is going to be uh, eating agricultural products from, from the land. But I do think uh, bio-based, biotech-based products will have a much bigger role, you know, in that long-range future. And, um, you know, it's important for us to get started on it now. Thank you. Um, so I think we're near the, the end of our hour today. Uh, once again, thank, thank you for a wonderful talk today, Dr. Hart. Thank you to our audience members for joining. And please join us next Monday at noon for our next Lunch and Learn presentation. Also, uh, today's lecture has been recorded, and so we will post it within a few days to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute website. Uh, if you check the events tab of our website, you'll find the recording for your reference, or if you want to share it with some of your uh, colleagues and associates, that would be great as well. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Have a good afternoon. You too.